Welcome back to Elements of a Garden, a podcast celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour. I'm Evan Meyer, the Executive Director of the Foundation. I'm here with Alex Hall, Dr. Alex Hall, climate <laughs> scientist uh, from UCLA and Theodore Payne Foundation board member. We're going deep on his garden, garden number six, and looking at bigger issues surrounding the elemental themes of his garden. And today we're going to talk about earth. Alex, I know the, uh, such a big part of gardening is that feeling of the soil in your hands and digging through the ground. Two questions. Um, one, what kind of soil do you have there in mid Wilshire? And two, how do you kind of think about the earth and the soil in your garden? The soil is a mixture of clay and organic materials. The area where I am now is near La Cienega Boulevard, which used to be a creek bed that drained through Laurel Canyon. So there's a lot of organic material there, but there's there's some clay also. And it's actually, you know, pretty good soil for native plants. Um, they, they seem pretty happy. And I haven't had to amend my soil or do anything to it. The soil has been really kind to me overall. For me, it's just like the most mysterious part of gardening because it's you can't yeah. see what's going on in the soil. And, you know, sometimes you plant something and it'll explode. Um, like it's so happy there. And then other times it, it'll just sit there. And it Why? has to be the soil, something in the soil, whether it's a pathogen or whether there's beneficial bacteria or fungi in the soil. You know, you just don't know. So it's kind of... I mean, every gardener deals with this, with soil being the thing that's unpredictable. And it is mysterious, even for a professional horticulturist trying to understand like mycorrhizae and how they interact with different types of plants. Like orchids don't grow well without the specific mycorrhizae that they're evolved with. Um, and other plants are kind of just, you could grow them in anything and they'll be fine. So it is this mysterious thing that's really largely unknown. And, and it does have the good side and the dark side, you know, being the soil pathogens are certainly real. And, and if you see your plant that looks healthy one day, all of a sudden it's just dead, there's a pretty good chance that this something is going on unseen under the ground. And this connects back to um, our water discussion. I had a friend um, and one of my native plants, you know, wasn't doing too well in the summertime. And he said, well, you need to just water it. And no. and I said, no, that's, that's, that's not a good idea. He said, well, you know, um, won't it just grow if you water it? And, you know, I said, you know, well, you know, because in the warmer temperatures, you have a totally different composition of soil, uh, fungi and bacteria. Right. And if these warm, moist soils are not what the native plants are adapted to, if you water in the summertime, some you know, if you water too much in the summertime especially, you can really kill native plants. Totally. I mean, it's kind of like if you leave your, your food out in a warm counter, it's, it's going to grow a bunch of mold and bacteria and, and whatever else uh, much more quickly. Uh, it's basically the same thing in the soil. If, if you're watering a ton and it's 90 degrees out, whatever is there is going to grow quickly. And typically what's growing in the summer in California is not something that you really want for your, for the health of your plants. Yeah, and sometimes I you know I look at, you know, like my manzanitas in the, in the summertime and they seem to be just like reveling in the heat. Yep. <laughs> in my imagination, they're like getting a cleanse, you know, because it's the soil's really dry. Yep. And you know all all the bad pathogens are are being taken care of <laughs> by the by that really dry soil. I think about that too, like like you're you're shocking off some of the bad stuff that's more adapted to live in a, in a wetter condition. You know, a lot of the really nasty soil pathogens that have been introduced here thrive in wet conditions, and, they, and they're pretty ubiquitous in, like, lawns and ornamental plantings. You know, things like Phytophthora, which is a really nasty pathogen that will kill plants, it really thrives in warm, wet conditions. So I think there's definitely something to that, that letting the soil between waterings or throughout the summer can be very helpful to kind of deterring the spread of, of all those things. I don't want to go too far into the negatives about soil because I, I see a bit of a misconception in the general public is one of the things we always hear in the nursery here at Theodore Payne is I have terrible soil and, you know, nothing can grow in it. It's just, it's bad soil. Now, sometimes this might be the case, but I think more often than not, it, it's probably not true. So, I don't know, can you push back on this sort of general conception or, or the understanding of what native plants need uh, in terms of the, their soil? Yeah, I mean, I think I suffered from that misconception, too. I grew up outside Chicago, and I did a lot of vegetable gardening in the summertime, and there is in Illinois that really rich black earth that, yeah. you know, you can grow so many, so many things in, especially food plants, like, you know, mm -hmm. vegetables. 
And, you know, in California, it's a different soil type. Um, you know, the great thing about native plants is that they are adapted to the soils that we have. And so generally you don't need to do any soil amendments. And if you are doing a lot of soil amendments, then maybe that means you don't have the right plant palette. So there's this notion of right plant, right place. And part of that relates to soil. You want to make sure that you're planting the plants that are adapted to the soil that you have, rather than trying to wish for a different soil that you create by amending. And, yeah. you know, the native plants, um, most of them are, because they are native, they, they like the soil we have. You know, I've seen over the years pretty extensive kind of soil engineering projects for specific types of plants. And if you have the time and the inclination, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop you. But I think as, as sort of a, a rule of thumb, typically just go with what works. So if, if you have clay soil and you keep trying to grow a plant that only thrives in, in like a really well-drained soil, just go with a different plant choice would be would be my suggestion there that rather than trying to turn your clay soil into a, a well-drained soil again you're just asking for a lot of time effort and potentially heartbreak uh, if you go down that path you know and I do I do vegetable and fruit gardening also in my garden I have a section of it that's devoted to edible plants and the degree of soil engineering that I have to do to right. get those things to grow is crazy yeah you know the, the contrast between those two styles of gardening or those two types of gardening for me, really underscores the benefits of, of using native plants in the ornamental parts of our gardens because um, yeah. we don't have to change anything. Yeah, and I, I think you're totally spot on about the idea of a particular type of soil that's, that's beneficial to a particular type of plant kind of becoming this like catch-all for good soil. So you, know, you think of that like dark, black, rich soil that you smell it and it's just incredibly, you know, fragrant and organic. And maybe for growing tomatoes, that is kind of the best, but it's not what is out there in the hills and, and the mountains around Los Angeles. And so the plants here haven't evolved to live in that type of soil, and they're actually not happy in that type of soil, typically. And, you know, they might look happy for a, a year or a certain amount of time, but they're going to eventually get root rot and die if you grow them in that super rich type of soil. So I'm curious, what types of soil, just on a very kind of broad scale like what are the different sort of types of soil and where are they coming from here in southern california well i'm not a geologist <laughs> so, <laughs> nor am i <laughs> so maybe we can make this up together <laughs> yeah we'll do our best any any uh geologists out there send some uh, comments to us about wh what we screwed up we're gonna do the uh the layman's sort of caveman version of this <laughs> <laughs> okay i'll start with the, the more riparian areas you know the areas where we have either running creeks and rivers or dry creeks um you know those tend to be I think a little richer in organic material because there's a little more biomass there and that, that biomass over time has accumulated and created soils that you know, have more organic material, maybe a little bit more like the classic vegetable garden, although not quite that much. I mean, that would be one type. I'll do the other type or another type, I should say, which is the type that is actually, it's kind of nice to have in some ways and other ways it's not super nice to have, which is the very well-drained kind of gravelly sandy soils. A lot of those are granitic, meaning their origin is granite. And as the granite breaks down and decomposes and turns to gravel, it washes down from the mountains and can form these pretty deep, pretty thick sort of deposits. And they're, they're called like alluvial fans or alluvial washes. And, and what that basically means is it's little bits of rock have washed down and created a very rocky substrate for plants. And the easiest way to see that is to go to like a still intact river wash, like the you know, the, the LA River has basically been paved over, as we mentioned, but if you go higher up, you'll see the origins of that. And then there are other places where you'll see kind of these gravelly expanses, and they have their own set of plants that grow there. You'll see a lot of coastal sage scrub chaparral plants, but then there's other things that are really associated with that type of uh, substrate, um, a plant like Mencelia lavicollis, which is this beautiful blazing star. And you can typically always find that growing in these. Really is that a wildflower? Wildflower, yeah. yeah. Beautiful wildflower. So that's that's where the, kind of the origin of that well-drained soil and the, and that well-drained soil from a gardener's perspective is nice because you can get away with all sorts of cacti and succulents and things from the desert. A lot of manzanitas grow really well in that, but it comes at a certain financial cost, which is that it takes a lot more water to keep your plants watered there. And if you don't pick the right plant palette, you're going to have to water it a ton. So knowing like what you have is super important to uh to picking the plants that you're going to use you know when i started to think about what i wanted to plant in my garden 
I tried to imagine what the place was before there were people. And, you know, I, I imagined the seasonally dry creek that ran kind of where La Cienega Boulevard is that was draining Laurel Canyon. And, you know, I thought, oh, probably that's why, you know, I have uh, quite a bit of organic material in my soil because it probably was a creek, semi-riparian. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of clay as well. Um, so I had this mix of clay and organic material, and I think that reflects what the place was. Yeah. So I think you kind of have to use your imagination, you know, when you're trying to figure out what your soil is. There. Yeah, and what yeah. would have grown there. If that place had were wild, what would it be? Right. Um, and this, I think, gets into, you know, reconnecting to nature and imagining the place where you are, which is inevitably going to be an urban environment, and thinking of it as a wild place de-urbanizing it, putting Humpty Dumpty back together again of, of the natural environment that existed prior to the colonial era and all the development that's happened since then. Well, you mentioned clay, which is the other big one. And that's something that we get a lot of people coming to the nursery being like, I have clay soil, what do I do? And I understand why it is daunting as a gardener because it holds on to water you know, for a long time. And then when it dries out, it goes completely bone dry and if you have clay soil at, at home and you've ever tried to like put a shovel into it, it basically turns into like concrete. Yeah, I use an axe um, <laughs> to, to, to tackle that kind of soil when it's dry. You have to. Yeah, yeah, you have to. I mean, <laughs> like I've seen people use sledgehammers. Like it, it's it's pretty tough stuff. But the other, you know, the the glass half full um, view of clay is that you really don't need to water it much, and there are a lot of plants that will tolerate it well. And if you pick your plants well, you can have one of the most drought tolerant possibilities of any garden if you have clay soil and you're using things like artemisia californica california sagebrush that, that does well in clay and, and just are being cautious and sparing with water you actually have the recipe for a very low water garden with that soil type and i think tpf has labels relating to clay toleration yes, tolerance yeah, yep. the tolerance or whatever yeah yeah and even outside of those labels a lot of gardeners who work with clay and just people who work with native plants, you know, in, in a lot of different places are kind of like, clay's good. You just be really sparing with water. So we talked about granite a little bit. The other major soil type that you'll see, especially in, in places like the Santa Monica Mountains, is sandstone. And just kind of interesting little caveman understanding of geology. You have uh, your sedimentary sandstone, which is older rocks that have been compressed and, and formed into the sandstone. And then you have the granite, which is a cooling of... Um, of molten rocks, is my understanding at least. <laughs> it's interesting to see different plants thriving in those different places too, in part related to the difference in the, the geology. I know just enough about this to be dangerous, but um, <laughs> I do notice differences on my hike. Yeah, and not really directly here in the Los Angeles basin, but if you go a little further afield, you'll find really unique soil types like limestone or serpentine. And on those, there are totally different plants. So geology is incredibly important in determining you know what what plants will grow where i think to me serpentine is one of the ones that's the most interesting isn't that pretty obscure like there aren't that many serpentine soil areas are there no there i mean it's pretty obscure the central coast of california has a bit and it's got this really unusual interesting kind of color and my understanding is that it's pretty toxic it's not that anything likes living on serpentine certain plants have evolved to be able to tolerate it and because of that there's much less competition with all the other plants that have grown more haven't ubiqu figured it out yeah yeah they haven't figured it out so they're so it kind of has created this own little suite of plants that lives just on those serpentine areas um which is pretty interesting i think is that does that have any relevance to an urban garden in la you know i would probably not <laughs> <laughs> okay. but you know you i'm always surprised by people going super deep and getting really esoteric with with growing like obscure plants and i love that I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody out there who's trying to grow like serpentine endemic species there's um, hope Evan. yeah <laughs> there's hope <laughs> one area that i've explored a bit is the marble outcroppings up in the the Cahuilla river drainage which is up in like the foothills of sequoia uh, national park and those marble outcrops have these really rare plants that only grow on, on those areas and there's one in particular that we've gone and visited for a couple of years now and we keep trying to bring back a few seeds to, to grow it it's a beautiful little buckwheat so you never know you know sometimes you bring these plants from really unique kind of soil types and they also just end up doing fine in an urban environment you have to experiment i mean that's goes back to the mystery of soils you know sometimes you just have to try it and the soils and the conditions that we've created sometimes end up mimicking other places. Like a lot of the plants of the eastern Mojave Desert do really well in Los Angeles gardens and kind of scratch your head and wonder why. And 
you know, one of the things is we've paved so much that there's this, you know, effects of this kind of refractive environment of, of heat and light, similar to that more of desert landscape versus the shrub landscape. And they've also adapted to watering here, which is often, you know, getting runoff from other other plantings, getting summer water. So because they benefit from those summer thunderstorms in the desert once in a while. So exactly. they're, they're kind of they're kind of OK with a little summer water in some ways, more like conventional landscaping plants because you can water them whenever you want to. The unique kind of urban environment that has been manufactured is is not the same as, you know, as it was 500 years ago, let alone 20,000 years ago. For each of our five episodes, we've asked a different member of the Theodore Payne Foundation staff to pick a plant that reminds them of that theme and describe it. Hello, everyone. My name is Alejandro Lemus, and I am the horticulturist at Theodore Payne Foundation. For today's theme of Earth, I decided to go with the spotted Humboldt's lily, or Lilium Humboldtii. I think this plant does a great job at encapsulating this theme of Earth because it's entire life is quite literally spent in the earth under the soil. The Humboldt's lily, it's, it's such a beautiful plant. The bulb I'm looking at right now, it has this red color. And with the winter rains that we're seeing, or even on years where you don't have a lot of rain, this plant has enough nutrients in the soil and the, and the bulb underground for it to leaf out again. The first time I saw this blooming at the LA Native Plant Source Garden in Highland Park, you know, they were literally 10, 12 feet tall under a you know, majestic coast live oak. Uh, growing through all the oak leaf litter, um, through all that beautiful mulch. And, you know, when most things were done blooming, most annuals were done blooming, this plant was one of the few plants that were still in bloom. It has beautiful orange flowers with these maroon spots. It's such a sight to see. When this plant stops blooming in uh, late summer, you know, the seeds will mature. You get seed drop in the soil. Perhaps you get new seedlings the following year. Or since this is a bulb, uh, it will come back for the most part after a good rain event or as soon as the temperatures start to cool down in the next year and restarts that cycle all over again. And to me, this is definitely um, at least my favorite native plant that represents the theme of Earth. The other major thing that comes to mind when we're talking about Earth as an element in the framework of this podcast is the landforms and how much they influence and dictate all the other things that we'll be talking about today. Can you kind of run us through a little bit of just the basic land masses that, that we see here around Los Angeles? Yeah, I mean, there are these mountain complexes, the Santa Monica Mountains, the San Gabriels, the San Bernardinos, the San Jacinto Mountains, and they profoundly shape the climate. I mean, first of all, the much more coastal areas are much cooler on average. Um, there's kind of a natural air conditioning system in the coastal areas where we have air from the ocean that comes in on, on really hot summer days that cools it off. And the mountains block that. So if you are separated from the coast by a mountain complex, like if you're in the San Fernando Valley, um, you know, where I live. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you know, your summertime is going to be a lot hotter. Very hot. And that affects what you can grow, you know, or what is native to those places also. And then, you know, also we have um, the mountains really profoundly affecting the precipitation distribution. Yep. And so in our water discussion, we talked about the atmospheric rivers and when they do flip over topography, as that air is forced to rise up over the topography, the water condenses and produces a lot of cloud and precipitation. And so the higher elevations tend to have a lot more precipitation than the lower elevations, except if you're on the desert side of the mountains where... Um, the water is now flowing downhill, or the air, I'm sorry, is now flowing downhill, and that air has been depleted in moisture, and, and so the, there's not as, nearly as much rain falling on the other side of the mountain, the desert side. So, you know, we have these extreme variations in precipitation, and some of the mountainous areas can get in a storm, you know, four to five times as much precipitation as the coastal area. And then the desert might get almost nothing in the same storm. So this distribution of precipitation and temperature, you know, if we look at it on average, we call that climate. There are these enormous variations across the landscape. And what that means for our plants is that, it, you know, it's not obvious, you know, what it, what's actually native. And, you know, we have to think carefully about planting plants that are, are very adapted to the lo very local environment. And that's one reason why a lot of people advocate for very local native plants. The plants are very adapted to the local precipitation and temperature. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really good point, and and um, yeah, the rain shadow effect is is pretty interesting. I mean, in the Sierra Nevada, for example, in the lower 
half of the Sierra Nevada, you have some of the highest mountains in North America. And so the ocean side of those mountains, you have a huge amount of precipitation. On the other side, you have Death Valley, one of the driest places in the world because of the rain shadow effect. It's pretty dramatic. Yeah, it's a dramatic place to live. And I think that idea about honing in on hyper-specific plants is an important one. If you live in Palm Springs, just because you're in California doesn't mean that a redwood is going to grow well. Redwoods are, of course, from the you know foggy northern coast, which gets much higher levels of precipitation than we see even here in Southern California. So there is a lot of nuance and that variability of the climate is so impacted by the, these landforms and by the earth itself, which I think is really fascinating. One little kind of tidbit as a gardener, I remember looking at like the zoning maps of, of you know, what, what zone are you in as a gardener? And if you go look at a map of sort of America, you'll see like these nice even bands going across the east and the Midwest, because it's really, a lot of it is just based on your latitude. When you come to the West Coast, those nice even bands of what zone are you in horticulturally turn into this sort of kaleidoscope, swirly puddles of watercolors mess. Uh, and, and so that makes it more interesting to grow native plants and to think of as an ecological gardener out here, but it also makes it more difficult and you have to do a little more homework. One tool that I rely on um, a lot is Calscape. It's a website you can type in, you know, where you live and it shows you would have been locally native there based on, you know, the climate in your in your area. And so it, it's a tool that you can use to try to infer what would have been locally native. But, you know, that's, again, a, you know, one of the joys of native gardening is that you learn a lot about the native flora. But one of the drawbacks is, you know, you have to do your homework. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know. Find people to do your homework for you. Yes, yes. <laughs> that that's too. more likely, right? <laughs> what most people are going to do. And that's, I mean, yeah. that's the hope, I think, with native gardening is that we can develop a, an economy around it. And it's getting there. I mean, it's interesting. It's great to see all the progress that, that's happening. So that subject of locality and how local should you go with natives is a really interesting one. And it's a kind of a debate that's playing out right now in the world of ecological gardening. It's something that at Theodore Payne Foundation we have been really interested in for a long time. For the last decade plus, we've been running a program called our Local Source Initiative, where we go and collect small amounts of seed from local wildlands and then grow those plants out and track their provenance throughout the whole nursery production all the way into the retail so that you can go and you can buy like an oak tree from the Santa Monica Mountains. And if you happen to live in the Santa Monica Mountains, that's going to be the best you can do for matching those. And I think that's a really interesting development in native plant horticulture. It's the cutting edge. There are gardens that really exemplify that. One in particular, Garden 20, featured on Sunday in Sierra Madre, showcases the hyper-local native plants and, and what that looks like as part of a, a native plant garden here in L.A. I just love that you use the term provenance. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fine cheese or something. <laughs> fine wine. Um, well, I think we've had some good foreshadowing of what we're going to talk about on our next episode, which is the air and the atmosphere and I'm just kind of blown away thinking about this, how interconnected all these are, um, how the earth impacts the atmosphere, which then impacts the amount of precipitation that falls. And all of that is going to impact the wild plants around us and impact what we do as gardeners. And the water cycle, too, influencing the, the soils and the geology. And it's all it's yeah. so interconnected. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the water cycles depositing the types of soils, as you mentioned, at, at your home garden, you know, how you believe the soil there is basically a product of runoff, you know, the way water moves. Um, it's pretty fascinating. And, and just to think a little bit about natural precipitation and natural rivers and tributaries impacting the land and impacting the earth in the L.A. Basin, by and large, you know, halted that from happening. We, we discussed a lot, like storm drains, how our natural rainfall is all being diverted now here in L.A. But that's also making it so that the land doesn't go through the same processes of erosion that it once did. And when we try to rewind the clock on what LA looked like prior to all the development that's happened here, it was an area of meandering rivers and wetlands and willow groves and sandy banks and pretty interesting and beautiful to, to I, think about. I would, I would love to experience that. I would love to have a time machine and experience that. It'd be so amazing. Like re read, a, read a trashy novel. Yeah. Watch it, watch it, watch it all go by. Go back, yeah. Um, any final thoughts, Alex, on Earth as we as we close out this episode and, and head into uh, wind for our next podcast of Elements of a Garden? Yeah, when you think about the fact that, you know, plants spend half their lives in the soil and that that really is the source of, of their sustenance. And I think in a lot of conventional mythological systems, the Earth is the mother, right? It's the source of what where things come from. And 
that's the feeling I get in my own garden. It's where everything starts. Earth, it's the great connector of ourselves to our water cycles, to our atmosphere, to the plants that grow out of the soil. And it's a really interesting and beautiful and fundamental aspect of gardening. So thank you so much, Alex, for sharing your garden and your thoughts on the element of Earth. And in our next episode, we're going to get to something very near and dear to your heart as a climate scientist, which is air and the atmosphere. 